that's a really good place to come in and pray. On the back of our declaration of how great is our God, that our souls sing and they rejoice because there is none like Him. There is none greater than Him. There is no name that is above the name of Jesus. There is no power that can defeat Him. He has no rival. So church, we're going to pray. There are many situations, many people, many lives, many families that need Jesus to invade the situation. But how many of you know that this is what God does? This is who He is. He's the God who makes impossible things possible. He's the God who parts seas and situations. He's the God who is present in the midst of all sorts of things. How great is our God? How great is our God? We want to we want to give him praise. A friend of, of the the Sweeney's is recovering well. Had a big setback with a, a bad rugby accident, but is recovering really well. That's amazing. It's so good. God is so good. But we need to pray, Suzanne. Suzanne is uh, really struggling with her foot. Asking needs to be healed for pain relief. Needs to drive and walk again. Suzanne's here today, so I want to, church, if you're near Suzanne, would you, would you gather around her and begin to pray now? This is what we do best as church. I think this is the church at its finest, is when we gather around each other and we pray, we intercede, we call on his name. He's near to those who call on his name. I need to pray if, if, if someone's near, near Hannah Stonham, one of Hannah's friends in a, in a dance school, has been diagnosed with cancer after breaking her femur. So she's going in for, for chemotherapy and, and, and an operation after that. So if you're, if you're near Hannah would, you, would, Hannah, would you stand in the gap for your friend? We're going we're gonna to pray because although it, it's, cancer is horrible, horrible, I hate it with everything inside of me, but his name is above every name. And his perfect love casts out all fear. John's asked this coming, this coming week and leading up to, up to Christmas, some of our youth in, in year 11 will be going through their, their mock GCSE exams and it's, it can be a very stressful time. So we need to pray that the God of all hope and the God of all comfort will be, will be with our young people and the young people across our town at this time as well. I need to pray for a, a girl called Alison who's having to have an operation for an infection with the, with the sight in her eye and a, a, another lady called Holly has asked for prayers, had a, a spinal stroke, only in her 30s, two young kids, so we need to pray into that situation as well. So church, for, th for just the next moment, would you just lift up your voice? If there's someone sat next to you that you know is going through the fire, would you stand with them? Father, we call on your name this morning. Bel we believe with every fiber of our being that you're good, and we believe that everything that you do is good. We believe that your name is above every name. We believe that you are strong and mighty. You are the champion of heaven, the righteous one, the one who is filled with grace and with truth. You are present in every situation and we call on your name this morning because we believe that in your name is all power and might and majesty. All the people that we've named and people in this room, people we're connected to, people watching online that aren't able to be with us. God, thank you that you're present in all situations. We're asking that you would comfort and bring peace and hope and joy into these situations. We're asking, God, we believe that your name is the healer. It's not just what you do, it's who you are. So we're asking that you, our God, our healer, would invade these bodies and bring healing in Jesus' name that your kingdom would come, that you would reign over our bodies that you created. God, for those facing grief and painful situations, God, we God, thank you that you are the comforter. Thank you that you are not a distant God, but you're a present God. Our hope, our trust, our confidence. God, it's all found in you. It's all found in you. So our, our petitions, our requests, our supplications this morning, God, thank you that we can leave them in your hands. The hands that, that created, the hands that hold, the hands that embrace, the hands that heal. Thank you, God. We love you so much. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. I wonder if the service for communion would just... 
gather around the table for me and perhaps even take the cloth off. We're going to, as a church, celebrate and take communion together. So if this is... This is the foundation of everything that we are, everything that we believe. But I want to just read some verses from Isaiah 53. I think it's important that we just re remind ourselves and reflect on, on why we celebrate communion and, and what it means to us. Isaiah wrote this about Jesus. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people." He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good, pl good plan will prosper in his hand. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he'll be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many. This is us. That's us. We're the many. We're so good and because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. This is what you did for us. We were the rebellious, the sinful ones that you gave everything for. You bore all our sin, all our sickness, all our shame, all our guilt. You carried it on the cross and now your righteousness has become our righteousness. You who knew no sin, not just took on our sin, but you became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God and be able to stand in your presence with boldness and with confidence. It is because of your body broken for us and your blood shed for us that we are here this morning declaring that Jesus is Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you've done. church would you just take 30 seconds just reflect for a moment on what he's done for you your story your life how he's saved you how he's been faithful how he's been good how he's cleansed how he's forgiven how he's lavished us with mercy and with grace Scripture says that on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and gave thanks and said, this is my body broken for you. Take this in, in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of, of the new covenant. Drink this in remembrance of me. So Jesus, as we take the bread and the cup together as a church, as a family, as your body. We want to remember what it is that you've done for us. We never want to lose amazement and wonder and awe 
uh, what you did for us, the price you paid for us. And so in this way, we want to celebrate and worship and remember that you are our God and we are your people, that you made a way where there seemed to be no way. You saved us when we were lost. You gave us our sight when we were blind. You forgave us and now you call us sons and daughters of the living God, all because of what you have done for us, Jesus. So God, we thank you for your body broken for us. Thank you, God, for your blood poured out for us that washes us as white as snow. His feet, my Savior, the cursed Jesus. His body bound in drenching tears, they lay him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by.
So good. Just want to make sure everyone has been served communion. Has anybody not yet received any, any communion? Okay, we've got some at the back there. Good. Logistics weren't a strong point of mine, but I'm sure we'll make up for that. We're going to sing one more song this morning, continue just in our worship as we, as we have an opportunity to give our tithes and our offering this morning. If you're a, a guest here, please feel free to let the containers pass by you. But if you call Lakeside home, it's just something that we, that we believe the Bible teaches, something we, we believe wholeheartedly is, is giving of our, of our finances into the work of, of His church. And so we're going to sing one more song and the, the uh, ushers will come around with the containers. Cheers. To God be the glory, great things He has done, so loves He the Oh! 
Can uh, literally feel the smiles as we started to sing that song in the room. So good. Church, when you go say hello to someone, you got one minute. Go and shake someone's hand, give them the hug. Okay, if you want to take your seats, that would be great. So good to see you. Can you believe it is the 1st of December today? So good. How many of you opened Advent calendars? Yeah, good. Apparently I'm too old for one, so... If I can quickly run through some, uh, some notices, some announcements, and then we can, we're going to be kicking off our new sermon series for this Christmas today. It's one of them mornings, great. If, you're, uh, if, you're, uh, if it's your first time here this morning, it is so good to see you. Uh, you'll have hopefully received a very warm welcome and even a Christmas card. We give those out every week, uh, all year round, so please make sure you ask for one, but when you come in, you'll have been given a welcome pack. Inside that pack, these little blue cards, it just says, I'm new here. If you could fill that in, that'd be great. Hand it in to anyone you see on stage or anyone you just see, um, just hand it anywhere. Well, I'm sure it'll find its way back to where it's supposed to be. Within that pack, you also receive 
something that no one really cares about. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So sad, so sad. But it is the best pen you'll ever write with. So, um, and if the first thing you want to do is write a check for us, that'd be great. But those are in your pack. Also, after the service, uh, please, you are more than welcome to stay and, and have some time with us upstairs in our coffee house. We've got the best view in the town. And you'll also have uh, a menu board coffee, which is the best coffee in town. Amazing. Oh, we're getting there. We're getting there. And other things are getting cheers, which is great. If I can I'll quickly run through some notices. This Christmas at Lakeside is a very busy one. There is a full packed program. As you came in on the reception, there is the this month's edition of Lakeside Life with some articles and, and some great stuff to have a read through. It's also got all the information that you need to know for what is coming up this month. Every service, every meeting, every Christmassy item you can imagine. There is also these uh, Carols by Candlelight invitations. So if you know anyone called Carol, you can bring her along <laughs> to our, our Candlelight specific service. If you're not named Carol, I'm sorry. We will try and get you another one. But these are out there. Give them away. Get them to your family, your friends. But also get here early because it will be packed. Especially because John Illingsworth will be speaking. It is always packed when John's with us. So good. Also out there are these Christmas business cards. Last year, if you remember, we did these pay it forward cards. What we're encouraging you to do is grab one when you're out for a coffee. Offer to pay for the person behind. Make sure they haven't got like 20 kids with them first. <laughs> But just make sure it's just a person on their own. But pay, why don't pay for the drink? Give this in to the, the person behind the till or wherever you are. And just ask them to hand it to them. Just say, look, it's all been paid for. God bless you. Have a great Christmas. It's just a way for us just to spread some seeds this Christmas. So these are outside on the reception. Great. I'm glad that didn't get another cheer. Also coming up, men. Wow. Wow. So disappointed. But coming up next Saturday, so Saturday the 7th, is the, the men's breakfast where Andy Downs will be speaking this month. It's going to be so, so good, man. Good. I love it. Such a deep, like, uh, so good. So good. But can I encourage you to come along? See, I don't think, I can't see Hosea, but see, see someone, see a man, and they'll tell you all about it. Uh, but it's three pounds, you get, you get a full English breakfast, and it is a great morning that we get to spend together as well. So men, do all you can, it'll be cold, defrost your cars early, get here on time. It's going to be so, so good. And then finally, this Sunday in reception is the last Sunday that you'll be able to buy any of the B-free items. Uh, it's, it, it is going so, so well at the minute. So the target of £2,000, we are just over halfway at £1,100, raising money for, for the work in Cambodia, which is amazing. <laughs> But that means this morning you need to spend 900 pounds. <laughs> so, I will personally come to your house and wrap your presents if you write a check for 900 pounds and buy everything. I am great at tin foil wrapping. All my presents, tin foil. We need 900 pounds, so get yourself, have a look around, buy whatever you can, buy everything you can, and then give them as presents. They're so good, but it goes to a great cause. All joking aside, the work in Cambodia is world class. It is making a difference in so many lives. And so we want to support that as best as we can. So church, can I encourage you to support that as best as you can as well? Good. We're going to let our young people uh, and our kids and our, our amazing team go out this morning. So why don't we pray for them? And as, as we pray, Pastor Richard is going to come up and uh, kick off our, our sermon series. Father, thank you so much for our young people. Thank you, God, for the, the, the potential that you've placed inside and the gifts and the abilities that you give them. I pray that you would help us as, as grown-ups be able to call out the gold that you've placed inside of them, to be able to encourage and empower and champion our young people. This morning for us in here, God, we pray for Pastor Richard as he opens up your word to us, that, that we would have ears to hear exactly what it is that you want to say to us. Pray that seed would be sown, it would fall on good ground, that we'd be fed by your word and be able to act upon what you're speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, why don't you welcome Pastor Richard this morning. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. I really thought for a moment when he said about that extra £900, he said that if you come and spend it, that he will match fund it himself. 
How many of you think that that would be a great? <laughs> Maria's going, no. <laughs> Turn with me if you've got your Bible to Luke chapter 2 and we'll read some verses together in a, in a little while. But as Matt said, it's uh, the 1st of December, which can only mean one thing, that the Christmas season is well and truly officially upon us and everyone said who said bar humbug then (laughs) so as Matt said it in the run-up to to, uh, the big day itself we're going to be kicking off a brand new three-part sermon series this morning that if we bring that up there just called Chris messages okay just a little play on the word it's the best we could do pray with us the creativity levels weren't as high (laughs) as normal, but uh, that's what we're going to be looking at over the coming weeks. The only exception is going to be Sunday the 15th when the kids are going to be bringing their nativity production to us. So mark that note, that uh, date in your diary so that we can be here and really support them with that. But really want to encourage you to be here with us over these coming Sundays. It's a great mess, uh, a great series of messages that we've got prepared and uh, we're really excited and believing that God's going to do some great things amongst us how many of you know God's a good God thank you now also as per last year just before we get into the message we've got some Christmas giveaways as well so each Sunday when we're here I know it's one of them mornings isn't it and so but you have to be here to win them now how many of you grabbed a Christmas card when you came in or handed a Christmas card yeah How many of you have found a golden ticket within your Christmas card? Because the golden tickets are back. Just put your hand up if you've got one. Michelle's got one. Anyone else got a Christmas card? Some of you haven't even opened them yet, have you? You're just looking through them now. Look at that. They're all just being opened now. (laughs) Anyone? Anyone else? Sean's got a golden ticket. Chris? Anyone else got a golden ticket? It's all this excitement. Over here, Elaine. Steve hasn't got one. (laughs) Heidi, you've got one. Okay, so there's a number of golden tickets. Don't you love church? Coming along to church, all these unexpected gifts. But, you know, we've got more golden tickets and little gifts that we want to give away each Sunday morning in the run-up to Christmas. And there are some more dotted around this room. And so just before we get into God's message, because we want to spread a little bit of... Christmas cheer and just whet your Christmas appetite this morning, just have a look under your chair. Just have a feel and see if you see or feel anything <laughs> under there. And if you've, got a, if you've got a few chairs next to you, go and check all of them. So we've got someone here. Anyone found anything? A little Brucey bonus underneath their their chair. So Peter's got one. Anything else over here? Over here. We've got one there. He's got a lakeside pen in here. Is any in this section? (laughs) It's not the fire hazard sticker. Any in this? Have you checked the empty ones by you? You have? Because there should be two in this section. Any in this section over here? Over at the back? Any more around here? Okay, well, there were two in each section, so if you haven't got one, or if they haven't all been claimed, you can have a look and find them. But we all love a good gift, don't we? Just goes to show we all love a good gift. And I wonder this morning, what would be the greatest gift that you could receive this year? What would be the greatest gift that you could receive this year? You see, right at the outset, I want to suggest that whatever your answer to that question might be, that the greatest gift that you could receive this year isn't something that can be purchased at a retail outlet or it isn't something that could be ordered online, but it comes from a completely different place altogether. James tells us in his letter, James 1 and verse 17, he says that every good 
and perfect gift comes from above. Every good and perfect gift. I was in Liverpool yesterday. People, it was packed. People out there shopping for that perfect gift for their loved one, for those people in their lives. But how many of you know as perfect as we think those gifts are? Before long, that they're out of date, they're unfashionable, maybe they get broken or they get lost or discarded. It doesn't matter how much time and effort and money we spend on trying to get that perfect gift. There is every good and perfect gift, James says, comes from above. And we've got three such gifts that we want to focus on over these next few weeks that together reveal to us the message or the messages of Christmas and what the baby in the manger came to give us. And you can see from the graphic on the screen there what each of these gifts are. Peace, hope, and joy. That's what we're going to be focusing on over these coming weeks. Three gifts that I happen to think almost every person with breath in their lungs, whether they would admit to it or not, are searching for. And all of them are available to us. And as for the taking, in and through and because of Jesus. And the question I want to ask you this morning is this. Do you know these in your life? Do you live with the knowledge and the experience of each of these gifts in your life on a daily basis? Have you received them as your own? If you have, great. But if not, well, then you can. And you can claim them as your own. You know, gifts have to be received and, and opened, don't they? And unwrapped. Can't think of anything worse than giving someone a gift. A little bit like with your Christmas cards this morning. <laughs> and they're just left there and opened. As soon as you get a gift, the, the whole purpose of it is that it gets unwrapped and it gets opened. And you, and you claim it as your own. And there's these three such gifts that we're going to be looking at over these coming weeks. That, that we can do that. And I believe it's God's desire for each and every one of us here that not only will you know these, but that you live in the fullness of them each and every day of your lives where you can know peace even in the midst of conflict, hope even in the midst of despair, and you can know joy even in the midst of sorrow. Because these are the messages of Christmas, aren't they? These are what Jesus came to give us. And it's these, as I said, that we're going to be looking at over this series. And our prayer is that as we do this, and myself, Matt and David are each going to take one of these. And that as we do this over these coming weeks, that they'll each become more and more an integral part of who we are and how we live. And that our lives will be different as a result of it. So we're going to kick off with the first one, peace. So let's read some verses, shall we? If you've got your Bible open to Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read just the first 20 verses that we find here. It's headed up here in my version, the New Living Translation, the birth of Jesus. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David. He had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. And that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, everyone say suddenly. suddenly. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. What an amazing experience this must have been. And they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news. How many of you know the gospel's good news? He says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, in the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. 
And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And I hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Glory to God in heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. You know, Isaiah the prophet, hundreds of years earlier, he wrote this, chapter 9 and verses 6 to 7. He declared that for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, verses that you know well, and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. The most amazing proclamations given both before, hundreds of years before, but also as well at the time of Jesus' birth. Great reminders to us, aren't they, of the, one of the primary reasons Jesus was born. And that was to bring exactly this, peace on earth. Now as true as that is, and we'd all say yes and amen to that, because we know the story really well. The difficulty with that, I find, is that as you look at the world around you, and you see what's happening and all that's taken place throughout the corridors of history, it seems hard to believe, doesn't it? Peace on earth? Really? Because let's face it, the world hasn't been, and often isn't, the most peaceful place to be. Does anyone know what I'm talking about when I say that? Listen to this. It's been estimated in the, that in the past 4,000 years of recorded history, the world has only been at peace 8% of the time, or a total of 286 years. That includes over 8,000 treaties being both made and broken. Someone said that since World War II alone, there have been more wars than the combined total of all, those, of all those that had taken place before. Billy Graham once commented that if someone from Mars was to report Earth's major business, he would in all fairness have to say that its chief industry was war. Or as someone else once put it, peace is merely that brief glorious moment in history when everybody stops to reload. And as you consider that, and look at all that's taking place around us, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, this morning, that we live in a world that is characterized by fighting and rivalry. And it's not just nation against nation that we're talking about here, but we see the effects of animosity at pretty much every level of our society. Disputes and unrest within local communities are commonplace. The threat of terrorist attacks continue to loom large. We've all been sickened, I'm sure, over the last 48 hours. Again, another attempt and where two people lost their lives. That guy attempted to, to wipe out more in London Bridge. Thank God for, for those people who uh, just stepped up and rescued him with a whale tusk and a fire extinguisher. Have you seen that? But this is the world that we live in. Many young people rebel against authority in their search for identity and reality and security. Political debate is almost always acrimonious and vicious. You see, when was the last time you heard any of the political parties say something nice or kind or positive towards the other parties? Doesn't it do your head in? Talk to me. They're always just trying to knock each other. The breakdown of family life and married life continues to reach epidemic proportions. I mean, I don't know about Christmas being the most wonderful time of the year, but for so many it's the most stressful time of the year because finances are stretched to the limits and budgets uh, just go out of the window, don't they? With all the extra demands that are being placed on people. And you can see why that happens. You know, so often New Year is normally the time when gym memberships take a massive increase as people try and shed some of those excess pounds and all the excess turkey that they've eaten and the chocolates over Christmas. But you know, it's not just gym memberships that are increased. 
in January. According to a whole number of firm of solicitors, this is a real sobering thought, very sad, but sobering. It's also the time when there's an increase in marriage and relationship breakdowns. Read recently that between January and March every year, for many law form, uh, firms, it's the busiest time of the year because of the new cases coming in and divorce cases, the, the divorce lodgings being, uh, uh, divorce petitions being lodged. We know January the 1st is New Year's Day for many law firms. January the 3rd has been renamed Divorce Day. This is the world we live in. This is what we're surrounded by every day of our lives. Are you glad you came this morning? <laughs> you thought you were going to come to Phil Belly, didn't you? I'll go to church today because I'm feeling a bit down and I'm sure whatever gets shared is going to really just make me feel better. And all he's done so far is depress me over the last 10 minutes. But this is the world that we live in. But, you know, Jesus knew all this was going to happen. He said in Matthew 24 and verse 7 that nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So he knew all this. He said to his disciples, verses that we know well, John 16 and verse 33, in this world you will, you will have trouble. Not you might have or there's a possibility, but in this world you will have trouble. And so as long as we live in this world that there's always going to be wars and conflicts taking place. There will always be troubles and heartaches of some description going on. And yet having said that, there's absolutely no doubt or uncertainty whatsoever that one of the gifts Jesus offers to us, one of the key messages that we find within the, the nativity story is that of peace. Peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Where I think the misunderstanding lies with that is that it's not the kind of peace that we perhaps thought it was or what it would look like. You see, when he said to his disciples, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, I don't think that he was promising a peace based on our circumstances, but a peace in spite of our circumstances, in spite of our conflicts, in spite of our troubles or whatever might be taking place around us. Now tell me if I'm wrong here, but what I've discovered in my life is that so many people journey through life devoid of any sense of peace whatsoever because their circumstances aren't what they, went, what they wanted them or hoped that they would be. And so unless they've got the right kinds of relationships, unless they've got the right job with the right packages and the right things for when they retire, unless it's the right political party in power, how many of you know there's going to be an awful lot of dissatisfied people come December the 13th this year and Facebook is going to go mad as people saying I can't believe people voted this way and the other unless all these things are in place for so many people they're not living with any sense of peace just a whole lot of dissatisfaction discontentment disillusionment why because they're living in a place where it's their circumstances that dictate the level of peace that they have. How many of you know what that's like? How many of you know that's a very shaky and unstable foundation, if ever there was one? One that's so far removed, I believe, from the message the angels came to pronounce and from how God intended us to live. So why is it that whilst peace is one of the most significant words in man's vocabulary, it remains one of the most elusive in his experience? Because it doesn't matter, does it, how good our attempts are to bring it about, they just don't seem to be working. And if you're anything like me, the question you find yourself repeatedly asking is this, why not? What's gone wrong? Why are we surrounded so much by trouble and conflict? all the time. I want to suggest to you that there's really only one adequate answer to that. And it's not political. And it's not economic. And it's not social, but it's primarily spiritual. As one person said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. You see, according to the Bible, the problem lies within the heart of man. That's where the issue really lies. James, again, writes in his letter, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. 
He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. And when you do ask God, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. Little Greek lesson for you. That word that James uses there about desires, those desires that we have within, it's the Greek word hedonon, from which we get our word hedonism, which as you'll probably know is all about the pursuit of self. It's all about me. It's all about me. (laughs) All this is for me. And what I think James is saying here is that the cause of all human conflict stems from man's deep-rooted determination to get his own way. Whether it be things like pride or greed or anger, pleasure, power, whatever it might be, you can fill in the blank. Our lust for self always leads to conflict with others. And that's not just on a personal level, but on a national level too. Because as economies grow, that often brings about a conflict of interests as those who are in power are just looking to protect their country's wealth, which leads to disputes with others. And then we're often back in a war zone once again, and there's conflict taking place. Because in his heart, man is selfish. Just turn to the person next to you and say, you're so selfish. (laughs) Now respond back to them and just say, yeah, and what are you going to do about it? See, we've even got conflict in the church right now. (laughs) Now, to those of us who are Christians, to those of us who have surrendered our hearts and lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, this shouldn't really come as any great big surprise to us. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Because if we know our history, our biblical history, then we know that we can trace all of this way back to the Garden of Eden. See, the first thing that happens after Adam and Eve sin is what? It's conflict. They become separated from God. This huge void, this chasm develops between them, which then has a knock-on effect of them rising up against one another. Adam and Eve have their first Barney. The kids take it way further with Cain killing his brother Abel. And thousands of years on, nothing's really ever changed. It continues to happen. See, the fundamental reason why people don't get along today and why battles arise is because our hearts are sinful and they need to be changed. And sadly, until a radical transformation takes place within the heart of man, nothing's really ever going to change. You see, if you've got a mountain stream that's being fed by a contaminated spring that's polluting the the stream it doesn't matter how much time and money and energy and resource you put into cleaning up the stream it's never going to happen because the source is primarily bad the only way you can clean it up is by first going to the source itself to do deal with the spring that's feeding the stream and the same is true with humanity in that the problem of sin needs to be dealt with first This is why even the very best attempts at peacekeeping, and I'm all for that, that needs to happen. Jesus said, blessed are the uh, the peacemakers, those people that go and look to, to make peace. But even the very best attempts at peacekeeping don't work because they're really only dealing with the symptoms and not the cause. It's a little bit like putting a plaster on a cancer, isn't it? It's never really going to do the job. Here's the good news, just in case you were wondering if there was going to be any this morning. You're thinking, wow, Christmas is going to be fun in that home, isn't it? (laughs) Here's the good news. This is precisely where the Christmas story comes into it. This is where the message of the angels that we've read comes into its own, because what they came to announce was the solution to this. You see, if I was to do a straw poll this morning in our town on what comes to mind when people hear the word peace, my guess is that for many, the first thing they would think of would be the absence of conflict. 
no wars, put an end to all wars and fighting and terrorism and all that stuff for it to stop. But then we can know peace. But you know, biblical peace, the kind that the angels pronounced and that what that which Jesus offers to us, I think is so much more than that. You see, there's some 400 references to peace contained within the scriptures. The best known word would be the Hebrew word shalom. And for the Jew, this word had a whole number of meanings. To begin with, it meant good health. Another was to be in right relationship with others, this sense of harmonious living with other people. The third was to know prosperity and success and just to live with that real sense of fulfillment in a person's life. But the fourth was to know victory. Victory over your enemies, or, or like how we often think of it, the absence of conflict. So in Psalm 122, that well-known psalm, where the psalmist prays that peace should be within the walls of Jerusalem, he's effectively praying that every good blessing should depend upon the city and all who live there. And it was something that was used in both greetings and farewells, something that was meant to act as a blessing to the person to whom it was said. In effect, they'd be saying to them, may your life be filled with good health. May your life be filled with prosperity and inner rest and victory over the things that you're finding yourself up against. Put your hands up if you'd like some of that today. And you know, the New Testament's no different. Because the, the word that's used for peace here, the one that we've read, is the Greek word irene, which is a major New Testament word. 88 times it appears in the New Testament in all but one of the 27 books that we find. You could say the New Testament is very much a book of peace. Because the gospel is a gospel of peace. And its meaning is simply this, to join or bind together that which has been separated, making it one again. And I'll come back to that in a moment because that is so, so powerful. To join or bind together that which has been separated, making it one again. You know, it's ironic that what's probably the most definitive talk ever given on peace in all of the Bible comes from Jesus himself on the night that he was cruelly killed knowing full well what he was about to face, what lay ahead of him. He took time to comfort each of his disciples with this message of peace. What was it he said to them? John 14 and verse 27. My peace I give to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It's what one writer called the last will and testament of Jesus. Because in terms of worldly possessions, he had nothing to give them. But what he did leave them with was something far more valuable and of much greater worth, his peace. His peace, one that enables believers to remain calm in the most fearful of circumstances. One that enables them to still rejoice even in the midst of pain and conflict. One that enables them to sing even in the midst of suffering. I think of as we come into the book of Acts and, and Peter, Acts chapter 12, knowing that in the morning... He's probably going to face execution. And then the angel miraculously suddenly appears in his prison cell. And Peter's asleep. I don't know if that was, I don't know about you, but if that was me, I'd probably be stressing something rotten, knowing that I'm about to face death the next morning. But Peter was so content. He, he knew this peace within his heart. It's the same as Paul and Silas, isn't it? A few chapters on, thrown into prison. And at midnight, they began singing songs of praise to God. Talk about peace in the midst of conflict. You see, a man can live in ease and luxury, can have the finest of houses, the biggest of bank accounts, and yet not have peace within. And yet, on the other hand, a man might be starving in prison, or a little bit like the guys I've just mentioned there. They could find themselves about to, to, to face death or living a life from which all comforts fled, and yet be at perfect peace. How does that work? And so one of the things that he came to give us is peace, but more than importantly, a peace with your Heavenly Father. You see, this is the, the key thing I want you to think about this morning. 
You can't know the peace of God until you've first made your peace with God. You can't know the peace of God until you've first made your peace with God. And so you can search the world over looking for anything that's going to find that, just fill that void within and give you that sense of satisfaction that you might hope will bring a sense of peace to your life and to your soul. And we go everywhere, don't we? We fill it with all kinds of things. But there's only one place that we can find that. There's only one person through which that can come, and that's the person of Jesus. That's one of the messages of Christmas, that you can't know the peace of God until you've first made your peace with God. See, I've said before what this word means, to join or bind together that which has been separated, making it one again. Is that not the gospel in a nutshell? Is that not the clearest picture of what Jesus came down to earth for? To bridge that gap that existed between us and God, to restore that which had been lost way back in the Garden of Eden, to bind us together, to make us one, to make us whole again, to know that, that, that shalom within our hearts. As I said before, we try all kinds of things, don't we, to bridge that gap. Good works and nice words and being kind and all that kind of stuff. But let's face it, none of it cuts it. It lasts for a moment, but then it's gone and we're searching after something else. You know, the Bible tells us that all of our righteous works put together is as filthy rags. You know what that means. What that picture is. Women's menstrual towels. That's as clean as our righteous works in and of themselves are. There's only one way that we can have our sins forgiven. There's only one way that we can be reconciled to God, and that's through Jesus. Accepting what he's done for us on the cross, receiving that gift into our hearts through faith. That's the only way. There's only one way by which man can be saved. You see, I want to suggest to you today that peace isn't just a concept. Peace is a person. Peace is a person. That person is Jesus. Isaiah said it. He is the Prince of Peace. And until you know him, then you'll never fully know and experience this peace that I'm talking about today that the, that the angels came to pronounce on the night that he was born. Ephesians 2 and verse 14 tells us, For he himself is our peace, who's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing walls of hostility, which separated us. I remember seeing a car bumper sticker a number of years back. I thought it was so good. It said very simply this, no God, no peace. No God, no peace. That's the simple message that I've got to share with you this morning. No God, no peace. But no God, not just here, but know him here, and then you know peace. A peace that surpasses all human understanding. So that when you're going through difficulties, and some of you are going through obstacles right now, trials, some of you are just coming through trials, but through it all, you can know the peace that surpasses all human understanding, that can guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. How cool is that, church? And my question to you today, the biggest question any of us can ever ask ourselves in our lives is this. Do you know him? Not do you know it, that peace, but do you know him? Because when you know him, then you can know the peace that he brings and offers to you. Do you know him personally? Because until you do, let me tell you now that you'll spend the remainder of your life searching the whole world over for those things that satisfy, that bring you peace, but you won't find them. There's only one place you'll find it. That's in the person of Jesus. The early church father Augustine said this, you have made us for yourself. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. I quoted John 16 verse 33 earlier that says, in this world you will have trouble. But you know, there's a bit that comes before that. We often quote the bit that comes after it. But the bit that comes before it says this, I have told you these things. In other words, all the things that are about to happen to him and what's going to happen to them and the things that are to come. He says, I've told you these things so that in me, everyone say in me, 
in me, Jesus says, you might have peace. And the question is very simply this this morning. Are you living with this peace in your heart? If yes, then great. But if no, then I want to tell you that you can. Because the offer is there for you. And you can make right, right now you can make absolutely sure that this peace is yours. And you can walk away today with this cemented in your heart. I wonder if the musicians can come back. Join me. You see, all you have to do is just say yes to Jesus. This is a very simple message to kick off our series this morning. But you know, this is one of the most important messages that any of us can ever hear, that we can know the peace of God in our hearts. Even in the midst of conflict, we can know his peace. And all you have to do is say yes to Jesus, to receive him in your heart by faith. You see, peace isn't found in the absence of a storm. It's found in the presence of God. And this is the major difference, isn't it, between Christianity, between our faith and other world religions. Religion works from the outside in. It says, these are the rules and regulations that you need to live by. And if you do X, Y, and Z, then you might earn your acceptance before God. Whereas Christianity is based on a relationship with a person. And it works from the inside out because he comes and gets hold of your heart. And then just through living with him and communing with him and getting to know him, the Holy Spirit begins to work on the inside of your heart that brings about the changes within. And so just as a, a natural outworking of what we've believed and what we've received, we begin to do those works because they should just come natural to us as children of God. And I don't know if you've prayed a prayer of salvation by that I mean that you've invited Jesus the Prince of Peace to come into your heart by faith and as I look around this room this morning I, I know most of you and I know that most of you have prayed this prayer but every Sunday we want to give people an opportunity just in case to pray a prayer of salvation to invite Christ into their hearts and to know this new life that he offers us, to know this peace that I've been talking about, to come and flood their hearts. And I just wonder if you could just bow your heads with me for a moment and maybe just close your eyes because we wanted to make this just a personal moment for people here. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm just going to ask you very simply that if you want to make this prayer your own, that you just simply say amen right at the very end. And then I'm going to ask you to do something and that's just to put your hand up when I ask you to. That just to acknowledge that you've prayed this prayer. So that we can identify that. And then someone will come alongside you afterwards. Just give you some literature to help you take these first steps. So that you can walk away a brand new creation. That you can walk away knowing this peace of God in your heart today. Just pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus. I come before you this morning. The Prince of Peace. And I acknowledge that I haven't been living for you. That I don't know you as my Prince of Peace. That I've, I don't know what it is to have this new start in life that I've heard about this morning. But I know that I want that for myself. And I want to have a cast iron assurance that I am a child of God. That I belong to you. That my sins have been forgiven. And that heaven is my eternal home. And so today... I come before you, I turn away from my sin, from the things I've done wrong, and I turn around and I now make you my Lord and my Savior. And in faith, I ask you to come and live within me by your Holy Spirit and to fill me with this peace that surpasses all human, human understanding, that it would guard my heart and my mind today in Christ Jesus. And Lord, help me from this moment on to live for you and to grow in my journey and my understanding of who you are that I can become more and more the person that you've called me to be and live out the amazing destiny that you've created for me even before the beginning of time itself. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Today I give my life to you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now just keep your eyes closed for a moment. And your head's bowed. We're going to sing a song to finish with in a second. But is there anyone here that's prayed that prayer for the first time? 
He's saying, Jesus, I want you. If that's you, just while every head's bowed, on the count of three, I just want you to put your hand up in the air. As I say, someone will pray with you afterwards. One, two, three. Is that you? Just put your hand up this morning, if that's you. He's saying yes to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've given your heart to the Lord already at some point in the past, but you know that you don't have that peace. And you're saying, Lord, I need this because there's some stuff going on in my life right now. And I really need to know this this, this peace afresh in my heart and my life. If that's you, just, just raise your hand where you are. We're going to sing a song to finish with. And again, it's another great hymn of old. When peace like a river attendeth my way. You know, what's most amazing about this song is the story that's behind it, that the guy who wrote it, a guy called Horatio Spafford, back in 1873, he's coming on a vacation with his family, his wife and his four daughters from America over to England. But business held him back and so his wife and his children he sent them on ahead of him and he said he'll come and catch them up in a few days time and as they were crossing the Atlantic the ship that they were on got hit by a British vessel and not only did a load of the crew who were on those ships go down to their deaths his four daughters sadly lost their lives his wife survived And so word got back to him in America and he got on a a ship himself to come over. And just as he came to that, that place in the Atlantic Ocean where this collision had taken place, the words of this song came to him and he wrote them down. Can you believe that? Here's a guy who's lost his four daughters and amidst that terrible tragedy, he writes what is perhaps one of the most well known hymns about peace that has ever been written and ever will be written. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You see, this is the peace that Jesus came to offer us. And I wonder this morning as we close our time together, thank you for listening so well that let's sing this and let's just claim this afresh as our own this morning and declare that no matter what we might be going through Lord I know that you're with me you're for me if you're for me who can be against me and that let this peace come and flood every fiber of your being this morning let's stand together shall we
Jesus, it is all because of you. That we can stand here this morning, no matter what we're facing and no matter what we are in the midst of, we can stand here and say, it is well with my soul because your peace, not any peace, not a cheap peace, your peace is with us. Father, thank you for the incredible word that we've heard today. We pray that you would bless Pastor Richard for what he has poured out into us this morning. But we pray knowing that your peace is going with us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, have a blessed week. Make your way upstairs. There's coffee and tea waiting.